because the Bible is full of only good texts, and so you have to pick something. And uh, so this time around, I just decided to pick a text that I wanted to spend the week studying. So I picked Psalm 23, uh, just because I wanted, I thought I needed to spend some time in it. So uh, that's what we'll, we'll be looking at this morning. So if you could turn to Psalm 23, if you uh, have a Bible in front of you, it's on page... Where is it? 458 in your pew Bible. Uh, Let me read it for us. Uh, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Uh, Let me pray for us one more time as we approach this text. Uh, Heavenly Father, As we come again to your word, would it be true food for us? Uh, We come from a lot of different places this morning. Uh, We have many needs. Uh, There's a lot going on in each of our lives. Uh, We pray that you would meet us where we are. We pray that you would apply your word as a healing balm and that we'd leave differently this morning. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, When you study the psalms, uh, scholars like to classify the psalms because there's a lot of psalms, there's 150 psalms, and a lot of them are kind of similar thematically. And so to give you an example, there's about a third of the psalms that are classified as laments. So one third, this is the hymn book of God's people, Israel, and about a third of them are laments. And uh, there's also a, a decent number that are classified as psalms of confidence. And Psalm 23 is usually classified as a psalm of confidence. And it's interesting, because you think about God's people worshiping with these songs, and it's interesting to think that there's a bunch that, it's like we're gathering together, and what we need to sing about is things that give us confidence in the Lord. And I need to hear my brothers and sisters singing around me these words so that I can grow in confidence, so that God can be glorified, and so I can be formed as uh, someone who confidently trusts in the Lord. And the reason for that, the reason there's a lot of psalms of confidence in the Bible is because life puts us in all kinds of situations where trusting God seems kind of like the worst idea. You know, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of times in life where we think, you know, the one thing I shouldn't do is rely on the Lord. I should rely on myself. I should rely on something else. Um, so I, I have little kids now, and we watch some of the Pixar movies, Disney movies, and one of the movies I've seen two or three dozen times now is Finding Nemo, a great movie. Uh, if you haven't seen it, you should see it, because it's great, uh, not just for little kids, but uh, there's, it's the story of a uh, little clownfish named Nemo who runs away from his father, and his, his father's name is Marlin, and Marlin goes on this quest to pursue his son, who's lost, who gets captured, and on the way he befriends this other fish named Dory, and Dory is hilarious because uh, she's such a loyal friend, and, uh, but she can't remember anything. Like, she forgets things that happened like two seconds earlier, and throughout the trip, she forgets like why they're even on the trip over and over again. And there's this part where uh, they're se- Dory and Marlin are separated in their quest to find Nemo, And Dory, uh, a group of fish tell Dory, they say, when you get to the trench, go through it, not over it. And she's like, okay, through it, not over it. And then she reunites with Marlin. They get to the trench, and the trench is like super scary. It's dark. It's obviously a dangerous place. And Marlin, who didn't get that advice, uh, is like, okay, we're going to go over the trench. And Dory's like, wait a minute. I have this feeling like something is telling me we should go through and not over. And Marlon's like, no, no, bad trench. We're not going over. We're going over the trench. And of course, they go over the trench and they almost die because they run into a sea of jellyfish, right? Um, But the point is, what seems best to us is often the worst. 
Like if we use our own senses, what seems best seems is often the worst, and what seems the worst is often the best. In the Bible, the best thing for God and his people is to be near, or for us as God's people is to be near God and to be with his people, regardless of circumstances. But when life really hits, when real life hits, it doesn't always seem that way, right? So how can we endure? How can we stay close? Uh, how can we maintain our confidence and our trust when life seems precarious? And the answer that Psalm 23 gives is when we know, when we remember that we have a God who's a shepherd and a friend. So that's what we're going to look at this morning. God is a shepherd and a friend. And the first lines, the most, some of the most famous lines in all of Scripture are, the Lord is my shepherd. And it says something about him, and it says something about us, right? He's the shepherd. And if he's a shepherd, that means we are sheep. And I had fun this week doing a deep dive into some sheep research. So buckle up, because you're going to learn some things about sheep today. Um, I read this one news story. Listen to this. This is a news story from Turkey. It says, hundreds of sheep followed their leader off a cliff in eastern Turkey, plunging to their deaths this week while shepherds looked on in dismay. 400 sheep fell 15 meters to their deaths in a ravine in Van province near Iran, but broke the fall of another 1,100 animals who survived. Uh, shepherds from a nearby village neglected the flock while eating breakfast, leaving the sheep to roam free. The loss to local farmers was estimated at $74,000, right? Picture it. They're just like, one sheep goes off a cliff, and then they just keep following until they stop dying and start landing on this, like, pillow of wool and rolling off. Um, so that's what sheep are like. I, rem I read another story about a sheep named Shrek in New Zealand. Uh, Shrek, the sheep, wandered off from his flock and somehow avoided capture for six years by hiding in caves. And when he was finally caught, he was almost blind because he had so much wool over his eyes. Uh, a normal sheep has about 10 pounds of wool when it's shorn. Uh, Shrek had a very weighty 60 pounds, enough to make 27 men's suits. Uh, can you imagine how heavy that must have been, right? This is what happened uh, when sheep are left to themselves. Uh, consider, these, consider some more facts about sheep. Uh, sheep can't fight. They don't have any claws or anything like that. Uh, they can't run very fast. They're not very agile. Uh, so they can't, they, you know, ba is not scary, so they can't scare uh, <laughs> animals away. So what does a sheep do when danger comes? Uh, sheep flock when danger comes, which means uh, when a bear, say a bear approaches, the sheep will gather with others in a pack and run in circles in complete panic, just hoping the bear will choose someone else. <laughs> now, without a shepherd to protect them, they will be picked off one by one. Uh, so we are like sheep, and it's not exactly a compliment, right? Uh, but... I want to suggest to you that being a sheep is not so bad, actually, uh, right? Because the expectations of you are kind of low. Like, no one's expecting a lot, not a lot of pressure uh, when you're a sheep. And this is something, you know, I work with college students, and something I've heard college students say a lot over the years, and during particularly stressful times, exam times, when you're kind of trying to figure out what's next after college, is something like, you know, man, wasn't it great when we were just, like, little kids. <laughs> like, that was actually kind of great, because I didn't have to figure anything out. Everything was done uh, for me. There's actually one of the most popular songs of the last five years among young people is this song called Stressed Out by 21 Pilots. And uh, the theme of the song is basically, well, I wish I could turn back time to when I was a kid so I wasn't so stressed out. And it resonates with people, right? We just resonate. It's a, there's a reason it's a popular song, uh, because wouldn't it be nice if I could just, in other words, be a sheep. And uh, not only just be a sheep, because that wouldn't be so great, but wouldn't it be nice to know, like, I'm a sheep, and not only am I a sheep, but I have a really good shepherd. Wouldn't it be nice to know that I'm a, I'm a sheep, but I have a really good shepherd? And that's what this psalm proclaims. God is a really good shepherd. 
I want you to look at some of the pictures of God as the shepherd in this psalm, right? It says, I shall not want. And it's this picture of continual provision for God's people. Um, if I shall, it means I'll never want. I will never have a need that's not met if I'm one of God's sheep. Uh, it says, he makes me lie down. And it's this idea of the shepherd knows when the good times to like get his sheep to lie, like say in the heat of the day. Uh, he knows when it's a good time to lie down. In other words, he, this shepherd knows exactly what the sheep need. And it says that he leads me uh, to green pastures, which is where food are. And it talks about still waters. It's literally waters of rest. And so it's describing peaceful places for rest and feeding, uh, exactly what the sheep need. And it says, he restores my soul. It's this picture of the return of vitality, providing all we need to thrive. Uh, God, as our shepherd, takes care of everything because we're not capable on our own. Uh, and the best example of how he cares for us in the psalm is that he leads us in paths of righteousness, which uh, is referring to his commands, his ways. Uh, it's, when we think about commands in the Bible, we often think of them, our instinct is to kind of think of them as burdensome. But in the Bible, the commands represent the best life. They represent a blessing, a life of flourishing. Uh, this last year, uh, for a while, my kids got into the idea of Venus flytraps, you know, bug-eating plants. And uh, so for my daughter's birthday, I looked on Amazon and they have Venus flytraps. And so I bought one. It was only like $15. And uh, so we got this Venus flytrap plant and uh, the instructions on how to care for this thing are very detailed. It comes with like, it doesn't, it can't go in a pot. It has to go in this like perforated uh, container and you can't use soil. You have to use a special moss, which thankfully they included in the package. And you can't, and so you have to place this perforated container in another container and you can't use normal water. You have to use distilled water. And I was kind of like, what is this? Like, what did I get myself into? <laughs> And, uh, but in all the instructions, it's like, we always get people saying, you know, what's wrong? My plant died. And they just say, well, did you use distilled water? No. Okay, you have to use distilled water. And so it's this very detailed set of instructions. And guess what? We followed it, and it's still alive today. <laughs> God's commands are like that. They're detailed, but they're for our flourishing. Because he knows exactly how to live. He knows exactly what we need to live, and it's for his name's sake, which is saying he's personally invested in our flourishing as we follow him. And, and then it goes on to say, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And I just want to acknowledge this morning that some of us walked in here in the valley of the shadow of death. Like, this is an image that you don't need to explain to anyone, right? Right? if you've lived life for more than like seven years. Uh, we all know what it's like to face what feels like the valley of the shadow of death. And this is written by David. David, knows, David ran for his life for significant portions of his life. He lived in the wilderness for significant portions of his life. And we just know life is often this way kind of feels like death. It kind of feels like the walls are closing in on me. It kind of feels like I'm not going to survive this. And remember what sheep are like. They can't defend themselves. Think about how vulnerable a sheep is in the valley of the shadow of death. And it's a picture of us. And yet, David writes, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And, rod and the rod and the staff was how the shepherd got the sheep to where they were supposed to go. And the idea, the, the, the idea is, again, it's a good thing. I don't have to figure this out on my own because I can't. I'm incapable of figuring it out on my own. But thankfully, the shepherd knows and the shepherd is with me. I cannot be afraid because of who is with me. Now, some of you, I've told some of you, I think I've mentioned here that I'm, uh, my dad is Brazilian. I'm half Brazilian. I was born in Brazil, actually. And I have cousins that still, aunts and uncles, still live in Brazil. I get to see them every now and then. And 
I have this one cousin who lives in Brazil who's a mixed martial arts fighter and instructor. Uh, Brazilians are really into MMA, mixed martial arts. And uh, so this is like the kind of fighting like, it's in the octagon, you know, you're in this cage and you just like, it's brutal, uh, extreme fighting. They, these guys who do it are trained in many forms of martial arts and they just kind of know how to fight and know how to do it all. And this cousin of mine uh, not only has fought in those uh, situations, but he has trained uh, world champion fighters. And I don't see him very often, I see him every few years, but you know, I can remember a few years ago walking around Washington, D.C. with him, and this thought came to my mind where I was just like, you know, if someone were to mess with us, <laughs> like, we'd probably be okay. You know, I kind of hope someone tries to mess with us just to see what would happen, because he's a fighting machine, this guy, and my cousin. Um, it matters who's with you. Who's with us? as we go through the valley of the shadow of death. Uh, it's a good shepherd, and this good shepherd has defeated death. That's who's with us. That's who goes with us. Uh, so God is our shepherd, and him being our shepherd is so good. Uh, like, you could end the psalm there, and it would be so good, but there's more, because he's not just our shepherd. Uh, he's also our friend. He's depicted as our friend. And we see that in the image of the table. It says, you prepare a table before me. And in ancient times, uh, you didn't eat with just anyone. Eating was a sign of intimacy. It was, when, we ate together, when you eat together, it was the sign of intimacy and friendship. Uh, one commentator says, to be God's guest, as is depicted here, is to be more than an acquaintance invited for a day, it is to live with him. Uh, so it's talking about friendship and intimacy as the image of what our relationship is like with God. And there's, these, there's the anointing with oil, and there's the overflowing cup. And it's this picture of the ex extravagant things that we'll do, uh, that a friend will do for a friend. I've been blessed with some really good friends in my life. Uh, I can remember when I was in high school, I, I had a brain tumor, a benign tumor that needed to be surgically removed. And so I had brain surgery, successful, thank the Lord. And I can remember sitting in my hospital bed as a few of my friends from high school walked in and they had all shaved their heads in solidarity with me. And uh, to their dismay, the surgeon had not shaved any of my head. <laughs> and, but for weeks, it was just, whenever I saw them, it was this reminder, like, look at the love of my friends. Right? I'd see them in school, they all have the shaved heads, I don't, and uh, it was great. I can remember uh, one of the best birthdays I ever had, my wife Maggie, who is my best friend, uh, invited a bunch of my friends from college uh, to fly up here without me knowing that they were coming, and it was a total surprise. Uh, four, uh, five friends fly up from different places, surprise me, and we just have the best time together. You know, they, they bought plane tickets, rented cars, all to just come celebrate my birthday with me. And what we need to see is that God is a friend like that to his people. He lives to bless his people and to draw them near. And he's not just a friend, though. He's the friend you want to have. Like, he's a friend that's also in control. He's a friend that has already subdued our enemies. I love the picture of you, uh, a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I didn't understand what that meant for a long time. Uh, what does it mean that you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies? And what's in view is this picture of like, we're, our enemies are here and we're just eating because we're not scared of you. We're fine. Uh, it's almost like, uh, I don't know if anyone has ever done this. When I was in college, I was into college sports. I went to a lot of the basketball games on my campus. And uh, when your team wins a game at home that you were really supposed to lose, like a really good team comes into town and you beat them, uh, you storm the court. And you're not supposed to, like there's all kinds of security reasons why you shouldn't storm the court. But if the victory is good enough, uh, and the upset is big enough, it's just accepted that like a couple thousand college students are just gonna run on the, onto the court and there's nothing anybody's gonna be able to do about it. And I got to do that a couple of times in college and it's this amazing experience because like it's a party on the court except for like the 10 or so guys on the other team that have to like sulk off the court while we're all just like mocking them. And think about like I wouldn't do that in any other scenario 
except that we just beat you, and there's so many more of us than you. And that's the picture of uh, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. That's how good the victory is. There's nothing you can do. We can just sit here and eat. We're having a blast. That's a picture of life with God in the face of danger. It's not just a lack of fear, but it's confidence. And so the psalmist's conclusion then is, well, if God is a shepherd and God is a friend, then surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Uh, This is an amazing verse, and the Hebrew words make it more amazing. So I'm just going to do a quick uh, Hebrew lesson for you uh, to wrap this up. Uh, Surely goodness. Goodness is good. It's the Hebrew word tov. Uh, Surely good. And uh, the word that we translate mercy is actually a Hebrew word hesed, which is normally often translated as steadfast love or loving kindness. So it's this love that's rooted in a covenant. Like the closest thing we have to it is marriage love. It's, it's not just a love of feeling and it's not just deep love, but it's a love where I'm actually bound to, God is bound to love his people because of his promises, because of his covenant. So it's saying surely goodness and this kind of strong love, this hesed, which is better than any love there is, will follow me. And for a long time when I read follow me, I kind of pictured follow, like I'm up here and it's following me at a distance. And that's not the idea. The idea is that the Hebrew word there is radaf, and it means pursue. It can mean chase. It can even mean persecute. Okay, so think about what it's saying now. God's goodness, his chesed, his covenant love, is pursuing you. It's chasing you. It's hunting you down. Do you know how far it is from heaven to earth? Uh, one, in my sheep research this uh, week, I watched a short documentary about shepherds in India going on a long journey with their sheep to a place where there was better grass. And at the end, it's this arduous journey across rocky terrain with all these sheep, and it's just camping out and living with the sheep. And uh, at the end of this short documentary I watched, the shepherds talk about what their life is like. And they just, this is from the movie. It says, uh, they say, it's a very tough life, ours we have to become cattle. To successfully raise cattle, you have to become like them. There's no eating on time, nor sleeping or waking up, no cleanliness or personal hygiene. If someone takes up this life, he will soon start doubting his decision. That's how God has pursued us. Uh, cause, God's pursuit of us has caused, us caused him not only to become like us, but to die like us so that we would not have to die. And that's the God that pursues you now. He's coming for you. He died for you. He's not going to quit now after that. And if you don't feel it today, it doesn't mean it's not happening. Think about Maggie and my friends planning the surprise for me for my birthday, months in advance. I didn't feel their love. I didn't know, you know, but behind the scenes, there's plane tickets being purchased, there's cars being rented, there's plans being made, all in love for me. Think about Israel, God's people, who sang this psalm. Think about Israel in Egypt for 430 years. Think about Israel in the promised land with all the bad kings. Think about the exile to Babylon. Think about Israel in the 400 years or so between when Malachi, the last prophet, spoke and John the Baptist showed up, uh, where Rome showed up in between. You not feeling it does not mean that God is not pursuing you with his love. 
It is actually his character to pursue you in his love. Now, what happens when you come to know the pursuing love of the shepherd and the friend? What happens is that obedience and faith become an instinct. What happens is that confidence abounds. Listen to one more story about sheep that I read from an author named Sheila Walsh, who grew up in Scotland around sheep. Listen to what she writes. She says, Every now and then a ewe will give birth to a lamb and immediately reject it. Sometimes the lamb is rejected because they are one of twins and the mother doesn't have enough milk, or she is old and frankly quite tired of the whole business. They call those lambs bummer lambs. Unless the shepherd intervenes, the lamb will die. So the shepherd will take that little lost one into his home and feed it from a bottle and keep it warm by the fire. He will wrap it up warm and hold it close enough to hear his heartbeat. When the lamb is strong, the shepherd will place it back in the field with the rest of the flock. Off you go now. You can do this. I'm right here. And the most beautiful sight to see is when the shepherd approaches his flock in the morning and calls them out because the first to run to him are the bummer lambs because they know his voice. When you know the pursuing love of the shepherd and friend, obedience and faith become instinct. Who would run away from a shepherd so good? Uh, Maybe you're here and you're not a Christian. Or maybe you're here and you're struggling to believe. First of all, I'm so glad you're here. Please keep coming. But please also consider the life of a sheep without a shepherd. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer writes this. He says, Shepherdless sheep have questions but no answers. Distress but no relief. Anguish of conscience, but no deliverance. Tears, but no consolation. Sin, but no forgiveness. And in contrast to that, God's people dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What that's talking about is the special protection that God affords to the person who fears him, as if such a person is always found in the house of the Lord, with his divine presence hovering over him. A while back, a Presbyterian pastor named Eugene Peterson passed away. Eugene Peterson uh, had an amazing ministry, wrote lots of books. He was kind of a pastor and a scholar. And at his funeral, uh, his sons spoke, and they talked about how their father, this pastor, really just had one message. Like, he, they, they said he kind of fooled a lot of people by preaching on all these texts and in creative ways, but he really just had one message. And they said it was the same message that he used to whisper over us as we slept. He said he'd come into their room at night and whisper this message over them. And what he would say to his kids is he would lean in and he'd say, God loves you. He's on your side. He's coming after you. He's relentless. That's the message of Psalm 23 for all of God's people. So that they might live confidently. So that they might be faithful in obedience. God loves you. He's on your side. He is coming after you, and he is relentless. Let's pray.